Hi guys, my name is Liz and today I'm going to show you what I read in February. For February I decided to only read books with pink spines. It was just a fun way to decide what goes in my, into my TBR. And I had a blast with this. I read books that I wouldn't have normally picked up necessarily because I was maybe in the mood for something else. But overall it caused me to have an amazing reading month. I started um, my reading, reading month with, with this amazing book uh, called Queenie by Candice uh, Cardi Williams. This story delves into the life of Queenie, a 25-year-old black woman who lives in London. Um, Queenie is on a break with her boyfriend and is having a really hard time letting go of that relationship. And she in general has been having a really shitty time. Like her job is going awry, um, she is struggling with issues in her family, struggling with uh, issues um, in terms of mental health and just in general struggling with all the kinds of things that every 25 year old probably struggles with. Um, first up, this book has been marketed as a sort of black Bridget Jones and while I get that um, people would be led to think of this book as some sort of Bridget Jones kind of book, I really think that it's been mismarketed because while yes, it's a young woman living in London, having troubles in her love life, this is so much more than a Bridget Jones book. And I also think that, um, that the description of it being hilarious and then a laugh out loud book is, doesn't do this book justice. While there are really, really funny moments in this, like really hilarious moments in this, it's a much darker book than um, quotes like this one from Dolly Elderton that says, hilarious, compelling, honest, I loved it, um, kind of mislead you. I love the way that this deals realistically, I think, um, with what it means to be a black woman in today's society for example, in London, um, because it really shows how many things um, a black woman has to struggle with. Like, this goes from gentrification to microaggressions to fetishization to um, dramas to everyday racism, police shootings, the killings of black people, Black Lives Matter. Um, and it deals with this quite realistically, I think. Um, because while this is definitely always present, like these kinds of um, problems that BIPOC people face is always present in this book, it also allows to have it to give her room to have like the normal problems of a 25 year old um, where you're like, for example, have to go to your gynecologist and it's really uncomfortable and the thoughts that you have while you're sitting there with your legs spread. Um, that's the kind of humor that comes in, um, but it doesn't shy away from the severity of the issues that people like Queenie in this book um, face. The only thing that I didn't like as much was maybe the ending. Um, the ending felt very wrapped up and very... Like, the author really wanted to give her a happy ending, which was really nice as a re for a reader and obviously lovely for Queenie, um, but certain issues were just dropped, in my opinion, and ignored, um, which I think made a bit for a weak ending, but I still absolutely love this book. I would recommend it to anyone. And yeah, if you're looking for a, a book that really shows the modern life of, of a black woman today, I think this is a really good book. Another thing that I want to mention um, that I just remind myself of um, that I absolutely loved in this book is <clears throat> that it shows different generations. So she lives with her grandparents um, for some time and she is visited by her aunt and her niece for a couple of times and because she lives with her grandparents then herself and then the niece comes to visit we have uh, a look at the different generations like we have a look at three different generations and it really shows um, I think the journey that that, um, that an immigrant family goes through so her grandparents are I think from Jamaica 
and they're really tough like they really tough it out um, mental health is just a non-issue you just you stick through it you you just go through it and you're supposed to be fine Queenie has that issue that she isn't doing well in terms of mental health because of drama um, and she sort of feels like she has to tough it out like her grandparents do because they went through so much worse but on the other hand she lives in this modern world has um wonderful really truly wonderful uh, uh, friends um who are the source of a lot of humor in this book um and they show her you know mental health is something that you can take seriously and that you can go to therapy and this is not an issue that you should be ashamed about and then there's her niece who's living much more a much more modern life she isn't so torn between these worlds of, of of having to tough it out and being at the same time someone who cares about their own, own mental health um and her niece is like you know just go to therapy it's normal everyone does it um so yeah really really good book i would recommend this to anyone i give this four out of five stars the next book i read was valentine by elizabeth fredmore I'm gonna try to show a picture of the cover somewhere here. Um, this is a book that plays in the 70s in Texas and it opens with the chapter of Gloria who is a 14 year old Mexican girl who has been viciously and brutally raped by a man and she's trying to escape from him because she knows when he wakes up he's gonna kill her because he has to cover his tracks. And she escapes to a, a nearby house, a nearby farm, and um, the woman there, and asks the woman there who was um, living there with her um, little girl and her husband, who's away at that moment, um, and asks her, you know, you have to help me, basically. She isn't even ask, asking for that. She's just asking for a glass of water. But the woman immediately realizes that this um, little girl has been brutalized in some way or other because she's completely beaten up. Um, the book continues to uh, show the town in Texas that has been um, going for some sort of oil boom, like a lot of um, oil has been found in the area and most of the men work um, to retrieve oil from there and it's a really hard life for everyone. Um, this deals with um, so much hardship and, and um, tough work and really harsh environments. And it shows um, the lives of um, a couple of different women. We read through different POVs and it really shows that even though men have, it really, uh, have a really hard time um, working there, the women have an even harder time surviving there. Um, women, women's bodies are constantly being found beaten up and brutally murdered and no one is really investigating it. Um, no one really cares. And Gloria, being um, a Mexican girl, is even less wor worthless in a way uh, to this society. Uh, I love the way that she explores a couple of um, the women's lives. I think it gave a really interesting insight into the lives of these women and the issues that they were struggling with. But there's a reason I don't have this book um, with me anymore. I gave it to the charity bookshop I run. Um, I really disliked how Elizabeth Wetmore dealt with Gloria, the figure of Gloria. So as I've explained, um, the book opens up with um, opens with the first chapter um, with Gloria trying to escape from this man and it's such a strong evocative and really thrilling and, and touching and angst filled chapter it's it's really well written I thought it was such a strong beginning uh, and Gloria herself who after the rape decides to call herself Gloria because she doesn't want to remind herself of the name that the rapist called her and she also says I am glory, I, I survived this, I'm glorious. Um, she is such an interesting character, she is so strong and she's so fierce and she's so brave and her will to survive um, against all odds is, is truly inspiring and, and she has such a strong and distinctive voice in the book 
And then Elizabeth Fetmore only visits her um, two more times in two other chapters. And the other chapters are just so weak. I really would have preferred if she just had not dealt with her at all anymore or dealt with her more seriously. She felt like an afterthought and I felt like Elizabeth Wetmore wants to deal with one specific character much more, which was Corinne. Uh, Corinne is an older woman living in the neighborhood um, who has lost her husband and is dealing with severe depression because he, she loved her husband very much and he killed himself because he didn't want to f um, deal with um, dying from cancer, basically. I, I would have liked the book more if she just had been like, okay, I'm gonna write about Corinne and I'm gonna write how this story affects the town and how um, it divides the town because some women are like, we have to help this girl and um, she has been brutalized and we know how brutal this world is for a woman and she is a freaking child for God's sake. And the other part of the town is like, she's a Mexican, like she um, she looks older and you know how these um, Mexicans are. They She probably um, seduced him and there's so much prejudice and racism that comes towards Gloria's way. And seeing that through um, the different characters' eyes was quite interesting. Um, but because she goes back to Gloria's character and doesn't just leave that first chapter and stand alone, um, it really feels like she's just not interested in Gloria anymore. And that felt disrespectful in a way. Uh, it explains itself in the afterword because the um, author describes that Gloria's first chapter was actually a short story out of which um, she decided to write a whole book. And that totally explains why the first chapter was so strong and so distinct. Um, but I really wish she had uh, put more effort into um, the last two chapters of Gloria. So yeah, I gave this away to Charity. I still think that it's incredibly readable and well-written after all, but I really had an issue with it. <laughs> um, after that, I read a book that I liked much more, which was Inferior by Angela Saini. Um, this is, uh, is called Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong and the new research that's rewriting the story. This was not what I expected it to be. I expected it to be um, to be, you know, people say that women talk too much, but science says this. And people say that because women's brains are um, smaller, they're more stupid or whatever. What she does, I mean, she does take this issue, these myths um, surrounding women and debunks them, basically. But what she really drives at is that um, science tries to find huge differences between men and women and that they don't really exist that much but they get published much more in in the media and they get a lot more of attention in the media because it just makes a far better headline but most of the science actually shows that women and men have so much more in common that than what divide, divides them and i really really love this approach because this was for me, a really new approach and um, still quite feminist. She, for example, shows how um, scientists often think of themselves. Um, we are completely objective. Um, we don't have sexism. We don't have racism because we look at the data. And she really shows how the data can be misconstrued and how it can be interpreted quite differently and how scientists themselves are not objective. They often look for what they want to find. Um, there's, for example, this um, really famous um, science project where they show that with, I think, fruit flies, um, the, uh, the, the female uh, partners are very choosy when it comes to choosing their partners. They are very picky. Um, and the male partners just want to spread their genes as much as possible. And this study that was taken in the 1940s, which has never been replicated, um, and that was rediscovered in the 70s, 
has been taken by the media and by scientists to explain, you know, it's the same with humans. We can totally draw the line between fruit flies and humans. And um, this explains why women are so picky. And they did a hugely flawed um, project where they're like, we're just going to approach women. Like, we're going to have male subjects approach women and ask them if they want to sleep with them. Well, the women said no, and the male um, counterpart said yes, and they took that as a sign that women are just more prude and they are less sexual, it, and didn't really take into account that maybe the women didn't feel safe and felt like maybe this guy wants to rape me. Um, and she really shows how flawed some of these projects are, and if you take some of these flaws out, it gets really different result because a German scientist, a male German scientist, read this study where they asked the women if they want to sleep with them and was like, I don't know, this doesn't really fit with what my girlfriends tell me because they tell me they constantly sleep with men basically. Um, and so, so he knew that it was an issue of safety and he changed the parameters where the women were asked out and by which men. And what he found is that women said, yes to that question much more often when they felt safe and when they felt that they could trust men and they felt like they weren't being put in a corner basically. I absolutely love this book. I would urge you to read this. This has been an amazing reading experience and um, this book was so well received that they made um, a book for young readers and they uh, put them into Put that book into schools um, for young uh, readers to find uh, to really read in their syllabus. 100% recommend this. The next book, unfortunately, was another uh, not so great book. I'm afraid. Um, I was really excited about this book. It's called The Book of M. I forgot the name. I I'm gonna show the cover somewhere here. I forgot the name of the author. Um, the premise of this is really interesting. Um, a plague or a pandemic, not like not unlike COVID, um, spreads through the world. It starts in India, where a man suddenly loses his shadow, and everyone is really excited about it. Like he lost his shadow. What happened? Like he's almost worshipped worldwide for losing his shadow. But what emerges um, after a couple of weeks that with his shadow, he's also losing his memories. Um, and he starts forgetting really random things. Like he doesn't remember his mom, but he remembers his favorite fruit and that sort of thing. And it gets really weird, like it spreads throughout the whole world. And even though there are no links, so it's just a spontaneous thing that's happening around the world. And sometimes um, only one person gets sick and sometimes the entire city of Boston, for example, loses their shadow and the memory. And the rate in which they um, lose the memory is quite different as well. So really interesting premise, right? Uh, but unfortunately, it got so confusing and so weird and you just lost interest after a certain time. Um, we follow a couple where uh, she loses her shadow and decides to leave her husband. I actually forgot the names already. Um, and she decides to leave her husband because she doesn't want him to suffer from her memory loss and also because the, the people who lose their memories can become quite dangerous to their surroundings because when they forget what a door is, they somehow um, develop magical abilities and they make all the doors vanish and some, suddenly you're locked inside your house because there are no door, doors left. Um, and this, this magic is, is really unpredictable. Um, it can turn into a really unsafe environment and she doesn't want to expose her husband to that danger and she decides to travel to the south um, because Everyone is sort of moving there and no one really knows why, but people think that maybe there's a solution to the problem there. Um, her husband decides, you know what, I'm not going to give her up. I'm, I'm going to follow her. I'm, I, I can't live without her uh, and decides to follow her to the south. And it, um, 
he comes in contact with uh, a couple of survivor groups who have still have the shadows and he was sort of trying to survive in this really hard world where everyone is just robbing everyone senseless because there's no food really left um, no electricity is nothing left and people are just trying to survive and they're quite ruthless about it and this is we are about halfway through the chapter uh, through the book here and you just you lose interest into what goes on with with this couple, even though in the beginning they were described pretty well and um, I really knew who they were as people, but um, the author just doesn't really delve into the emotion at all that it takes through, what it takes to go through a pandemic. Like we now are going through a pandemic and we know what it takes emotionally out of you and this is a much more horrible pandemic um, and she just doesn't really explore what that means emotionally um, they just go um, through action through action through action and it just never really del deals with their souls basically also what really bothered me the magic that I've just explained doesn't seem to follow any rules at all um, so, because if it means, um, for example, the Indian guy who loses his shadow first, he forgets a certain favorite market of his. He gets asked, where did you like to buy fruit? And he knows that he is supposed to remember his favorite market, but he can't. And suddenly the whole market vanishes. How is that supposed to work when the whole world deals, like, deals with this? Why does the world still exist? Because in the end, you will probably stop remembering that the world is the world. And it just doesn't follow any rules. And some things are just so... It feels so fake. Like there's um, an army that um, fights another army of, of Shadowless. And they are fighting them for books. I mean, I love books. And I think books are great. But this guy just basically wants to find his boyfriend's published book in that book area that the Shadowless um, have taken over. And he surrounds himself with an entire army that help him. What? <laughs> like, how is that realistic? It's not. So yeah, I DNF this book. I was really, really disappointed in that. Um, and um, I was quite sad that I didn't like it because I was really looking forward to it. But the next book totally made up for it. This was um, Transcendent Kingdom by Ya Jazi, who is one of my absolute favorite authors. I read her um, debut uh, Homegoing a couple of weeks ago. I finished it a couple of weeks ago. And it's one of my favorite books of all time and I was really looking forward to reading her second novel and I was not disappointed. Um, Transcendent Kingdom deals with Gifty, a young um, neuroscientist who studies reward-seeking behavior which basically um, can be used to explain for example uh, drug addicts and why, why certain people get addicted to drugs and even though they know that the drugs are killing them, just continue taking them and even if they go to rehab, just fall back into the old habits and others get out of that and others are never, never get addicted in the first place and she really studies why that is. Um, this is closely linked to her own family history because her um, brother Nana, who was athletically really gifted, breaks his ankle, I think he breaks it, yeah, um, in a basketball game and he is given um, opioids to deal with the pain and he gets addicted to them and he eventually starts shooting up heroin and he dies from this. Um, after her brother dies, her mom falls into a deep, deep, deep depression. She starts taking Ambien, which is um, ascri described to her by doctors to help with her insomnia and she gets addicted to that and um, Gifty really wants to find out why they both she lost basically two family members to addiction I mean her mom is still alive but she's a shell of herself 
this was so well written, this was so beautiful, this was so touching and, and, and yeah, I, I can't <laughs> say how much I love this book. Um, yeah, Jazzy really delves into um, trauma and, and what, how trauma and addiction affects the whole family. Because Gifty, for example, as a young child, is a very spirited child. Like she's, she's constantly up to no good and she's really fun and really loud. And um, throughout the flashbacks that you constantly have in the book, um, to, in the book to her childhood, you can see how the worse her um, brother gets or when her dad leaves the family because he can't deal with the shame of being unemployed because no one wants to hire a black man in the South. Um, how she warps herself to a person that can help her mother and that doesn't cause any trouble for her mother and really loses herself in that and doesn't really take care of herself. It also deals with religion because Gifty grew up really, really religious. Her mom is very religious. Um, the church and religion really helped her get through her husband leaving, her son dying, and she raises Gifty in a really religious way. And Gifty, in the beginning, is very religious herself. She loves God. She constantly writes God letters. Um, but she loses her th faith in church and in religion itself um, after her brother dies. Because what this book really shows quite well is how deeply racist society, for example, in the South, um, sh looks away from someone's ways when they profit from it. So Nana is a really gifted basketball player and the whole town loves him and cheers for him because he is constantly winning them trophies. As soon he, as he's not a model minority anymore, he they completely drop him and um, say really horrible things, not just about him, but about the whole family and how, you know, that's typical for that race to get addicted to drugs. And yeah, she, Gifty is um, understandably really disappointed and decides, you know what? I don't need you, I don't need your church, I'm gonna work as hard as possible um, to get somewhere in life, to understand how I could have saved him, basically. Yeah, this is phenomenal, it deals, it, it reminded me in certain ways um, of Queenie, no, even though they're really different books, but the way that Gifty is minimizing her problems and is has a hard time really confronting her emotional trauma and her mental health totally reminded me of Queenie and how this toughen it out um, attitude just doesn't work for anyone really and how it's um, how do you call that um, there's a word a specific word for code switching that's it um, how code switching is uh, prevalent for um, people like Gifty or Queenie who come from um, a, a black family, deal with quite a lot of racism and constantly um, go away from the way their family talks to how white people talk as soon as they're surrounded by white people and talk quite properly and um, basically try to erase anything alienating about them, anything that feels different and or, or black in this in this instance. Um, yeah, beautiful book. Read this. I'm gonna read every single thing that this author produces in the future. Pre-order anything that she writes in the future. This is such a beautiful book. Again, probably one of my favorite books of all time. So my lovely camera has apparently turned itself off somewhere in this video, um, so I'm just gonna continue on from the last point. <laughs> I think uh, the last book that it still recorded was Ten Sending Kingdom, and um, after that I read Heads of the Colored People by Nafisa Thompson Spires. This quite thin book is a short story collection um, that describes the lives of very different people um, who are all African-American. I 
love this. This is such an amazing short story collection. I think it's one of the best short story collections I've ever read. Um, it's really funny at uh, in certain chapters, like there's this um, influencer who is trying to get more likes by trying to kill herself. I know it sounds weird, but it's actually quite funny, that chapter. Um, and it's also very meta, like the first chapter is feels a bit weird, reads a bit weird, but it definitely works. I don't enjoy meta books that much, but this is so well written that it just works. Um, what I loved about this book is how it deals with issues that BIPOC people and especially African Americans face. Um, it describes these issues quite subtly. Um, it, it's not as strong as its example is for Queen and not as on the nose. It's all, always like a little tinge somewhere in the story, like always a bit of a trace of racism or um, tokenism or whatever in the stories. There's always... Um, it just shows that no matter what kind of life you lead as a black person, racism just doesn't leave you alone. It doesn't matter what kind of lives you, you lead, um, you will never not be touched by racism. I Yeah, I, I can't recommend this book enough. Um, this is really such terrific writing and I will definitely read whatever Nafisa Thompson um, Spires comes out with next. Uh, the next book I read was um, The Virgin Suicide by Jeffrey Eugenides. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. I read this for a book club um, and I also want to read more classics this year and this is one of the modern classics that uh, Bigoder um, publishes. And this deals um, with the Lisbon girls who live in Michigan in the 1970s and um, there are five uh, Lisbon girls and they all kill themselves in one year. This is the description of the book, but it deals doesn't really deal with the girls in, in the Lisbon family. It deals much more with the boys who live in the neighborhoods and who are completely obsessed with them. The Lisbon girls are quite beautiful, they're all blonde, they are quite um, slender, and they grow up in a really, really strict household. Like The, the um, mom doesn't allow them to wear any kind of revealing clothes and uh, it's really strict with them, and that's why it's called The Virgin Suicide Sides. Um, the book is written by a Greek chorus of men who try to describe what happened back then, 20 years later. They're all middle-aged, but, sorry, that was my phone, um, but they're still as obsessed with the Lisbon girls um, as they were as teenagers, and they are really trying to find out what happened back then. And the reason why I think they're doing this is because they feel quite guilty about how they treat the girls. They see them not as individuals, but as this one entity of five blonde girls who are beautiful. And they just project any kind of dream and, and longing onto them and never see them as the real people that the Lisbon girls are and they say so themselves that only at a certain party they realize oh, okay they're really quite different looking like they're not all gorgeous they one of them has a crooked nose and and one of them sorry my phone is bothering me um, um, one is uh, has a long neck and they're not as beautiful but even after they realize this they go back to throwing them into the same pot and um, not seeing them as individual people anymore. And because they feel guilty about not seeing them as individuals and not helping them, even though they realize the girls are trying to reach out to them, they do their best to, to find out what happened with them. They remember every single detail. They collect any picture they can find of the girls. They really, really try to find out what happened with them and um, don't manage to. They don't know what happens, happened, they don't know why the girls killed themselves and you as a reader are left with as little knowledge about their psyches um, as the men themselves. So I definitely enjoyed this. 
Uh, I definitely enjoyed uh, the mystery that he clouds them in. I definitely uh, enjoyed how he shows this obsessive way that the men and before that the boys um, see the, these girls. Um, but this book is also quite dated. Um, it doesn't deal with certain issues that the novel only strives on um, like racism it's it's only mentioned but only as like a little part um, the obvious sexism the slut shaming this was, book was written in the 90s and certain things would have the author I think would have given more attention to certain issues to, if he wrote the book today um, but I think it's well written um, it does have have um, quite long sections that feel a bit tiresome but that's supposed to be this way it's just supposed to be with to be filled with details that no one needs no one needs to know what the curtain looks like in the house of the listeners um but they need to know i i think it deals with mental health um from an outside perspective which i think is really interesting um and i definitely want to reach the read the marriage plot which i also have by him um, the next book I read was a graphic novel that I read in German. It doesn't have a pink um, spine. This was um, Brazen by Penelope uh, Pajou. I hope I pronounced this correctly. Um, this is a graphic novel collection that I borrowed from a friend, which is why I read it, even though it's not pink. And in these two books, she describes of uh, the lives of 15 women in each book um, that people don't really know about and who were raised as the book says. She has a wonderful drawing style. I really loved the drawings in this. Um, she makes sure to include women from each continent, from different eras and um, from different racial backgrounds. Um, quite a few LGBTQI plus uh, um, people in here. Um, she goes from actress to, to uh, scientist to queen, but also a completely normal housewife who decides to overcome um, the issues between pro Protestants and Catholics not being allowed to be married to each other. Um, and I really loved how she selected um, these women and didn't really only pick queens and or only pick scientists, but really made sure that very different lives are being told in here and how women can be brave and brazen in very different ways. This doesn't feel like a book, which I think often happens, um, where you're supposed, you know, you're only a feminist if you're trying to break through that barrier. Um, but she really shows how, how bravery can look in very, very different ways. Absolutely love this. Um, I really adored how she draws and each um, book I'm gonna find to find has a beautiful illustration at the end of each chapter. I would definitely recommend this and it's a lovely graphic novel that tells uh, the lives uh, of different women and uh, yeah, buy this. Um, another book, German book that I read um, was Starke Überzeugen by Sebastian Hermann. He um, I think works for a newspaper and in this book which translated means um, how to convince thickheads uh, he tries to tell um, how to or he tries to explain how conspiracy theorists uh, think and how to deal with them well <laughs> last year I found myself quite often in a situation of being really frustrated by people who think that COVID is just a flu and that uh, Black Lives Matter is against white people and um, who asked me, you know, why do you even go to Black Lives Matter marches? Why do you protest for that? Racism doesn't exist. Ugh. <laughs> really, really frustrating and I sometimes find myself at a loss how to deal with these people. Um, I definitely enjoyed how he describes um, the psyche of, of people like that and how they think and what to pay attention to when dealing with people like that. But it was written in 2013 and I th feel that ever that since 2013 um, the world has gotten more divisive and more filled with conspiracy 
theorist um, and I don't feel equipped to handle um, set issues and people that much better. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to another book that I've ordered at my library, um, which was published last month. Uh, and I think that book will help me better. But still, uh, a book that I definitely enjoyed, that definitely helped me um, understand why certain people feel certain ways about the world. Um, but I read other pick books um, this month. One of them was The Divines by Ali Eaton. Uh, this came out, in, I think, in January, and it describes um, the life of Josephine. Josephine is a 30-year-old woman who, at the beginning of the book, is on honeymoon with her husband, um, who asks her about her childhood and her teenage years, and she uh, explains that she went to a school um, that was called... St. John the Divine and they, uh, the, the students um, who are all girls, this is an all girls school, call themselves the Divines and they're very high class, um, very rich girls from very wealthy families and they sort of look down at the townies who are, you know, the, the, the normal people in, in the town basically who are not as rich um, and yeah. Basically, um, she went to school there in the 90s and the school had to close down in, after a huge scandal, a huge tragedy. And um, she is really reluctant to tell her husband about this and he basically lets the issues go. He realizes, okay, you obviously don't like talking about this, so let's not talk about it. And they sort of continue on their lives. They um, try having a baby, eventually have a baby and... and their marriage goes on and on, but she can't let go of of her memories of that time. Basically, with his questions about her school years, he opened up Pandora's box, and she really gets obsessed about what happened back then, and um, she realizes she is suffering from some sort of PTSD because there was a lot of bullying going on and a lot of weird shit basically going on. And what I really enjoyed about this book is how she describes the way that we see them ourselves and how the perception of ourselves by others, um, how that differentiates and how we remember not just events but ourselves quite differently than they actually were and how teenage girls can be really cruel and self-obsessed and all these things and I feel I feel like um, she describes teenage girls quite well. The first third of the book I didn't enjoy as much. I felt like she tried to be edgy for the sake of being edgy which I never enjoy. I never enjoy when an author tries to put on a mask basically. I it didn't feel authentic, it didn't feel real basically, I didn't, um, I thought no woman thinks of herself that way, like there's this scene where after she has sex with her husband, she looks at herself and describes her body and I felt, if I didn't know that a woman has written this, I would have thought that the, the author would have been a man because, huh? like it was such an odd description and, and no one thinks of her nipples that much. I don't know. Um, yeah, that was a bit off-putting, but I think that she really found her voice and her story um, uh, later on in the book, and I would definitely give anything that else that she publishes a try. The last book that I read, but certainly not the least, uh, was If I Had You Face by Francis Jaw. I finished this, I started and finished this today. I read this in one go. Um, this is uh, a book that plays in Seoul and describes the life, lives of five different women who all live in the same apartment complex. Um, quite a few of them work as salon girls, um, which is it's hard to describe. It's not a brothel, but it's, it's a mixture between an escort service, a bit of a brothel, and yeah, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a weird place where basically rich men go to to drink with 
very, very beautiful women with um, their business partners, for example, and they get drunk and quite often the women go to a hotel with them and have sex with them in order to get um, really expensive handbags, for example, or quite simply money. So it's a bit of a sugar daddy situation. What this book really does so well and describes in this Sonora Girls um, chapter so well is how to, is, is to describe how obsessed the Korean culture is with beauty, especially female beauty, and this ideal beauty that no one has naturally, and how they rack up huge, huge debts um, to get the money to get plastic surgery, extensive and expensive plastic surgery to look like the woman on the cover, basically. So they get their jaws dislodged, broken, pieced together in, in a much smaller way, shaved off. Um, they get fillers in their cheekbones, a smaller nose. Uh, their eyelid usually gets westernized or, or like tucked. Um, really, really awful plastic surgery and they're unrecognizable. And they have to work off uh, their debt and they can't because the interest is too huge and so they get indebted to the profits basically or the slums. Um, but it also shows uh, the lives of an artist, of um, a hairdresser and um, a woman who, who's trying to have a baby and who works at some sort of office. I don't think we ever find out what her job entails, she just works in an office. It shows how this patriarchal society really puts pressure on women and makes women work against each other and how women are very often the perpetrators of sexism. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this book. I, in the beginning, I didn't feel like the different POVs were as distinguishable as they should have been. I didn't feel like they had different voices. But I think that Francis Shaw does a much better job a bit later on in the book where you can really see these different personalities emerge in um, each of the chapters. I would definitely read whatever Francis Shaw comes out with next and um, I would definitely recommend this book. So yeah, I hope my camera has worked this time. I had an amazing reading month. Um, I am really glad I started to pick my TBR by color because it was just so much fun um, and it also forced me to read books that I just recently bought which usually end up laying on my shelves for way too long because I have this weird feeling that once I read them I can't look forward to them anymore if you know what I mean. Um, so yeah I'm, I'm glad that this has sort of forced me to read them as soon as possible basically. How's your reading month been? Um, what was your favorite book of February? Let me know in the comments down below. And I will see you in March. Check out my March TBR video where I only, where I've decided to only read red books. And I'm gonna post uh, my March wrap up at the end of March. I will see you hopefully then. Bye.